Howdy, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Fireblocks. Love, love, love this company. You'll be hearing all about them later from me later in the episode. But now, on with the show. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another weekly roundup. Um, I'm joined, as always, by my debonair co-host, Mr. Mark Yusko. Ah, on, Mark? debonair. I love it, and that that's perfect for the reveal. And you know, given that that you're hanging out in Denver, where I just was, full of mm-hmm. mountains, we have the the Bitcoin roller coaster socks. Today Let's go. <laughs> because it's really been like up and down, up and down mountains. I, uh, I was actually out skiing last week. Set a a PR for for uh, for vertical. Did 28,000 one day, which was pretty amazing. Uh, 20 runs. You. My daughter my daughter said, you're insane. Like, well, it was fun. Uh, but, can, you know, remember, you know, roller coasters up and down and up and down, and you end up in the same place. So we're the same place we were in Bitcoin a month ago. We're actually down a little bit over the past year now. Um, but that's a base effect, which we'll talk about. But yeah. Uh, and then you switched over from, from Bitcoin to, to ETH. So I did. Talk I'm at East Denver ETH right ETH now. Denver. <laughs> yeah, um, awesome. I, I'm an, I'm on day one of my my stay here, so I haven't had much time to get into the conference yet. But uh, it's great, man. Honestly, I think I heard like fifteen thousand people registered for the conference. It's great. Like you just tell the the attitude and the vibes here are super positive in general. Um, I did see a Doge McLaren, <laughs> which uh, I, I saw that. that I saw you tweet about that. That was uh, I, I I was going to send something back about you know it's it's probably going to be worth more than all of doge here shortly <laughs> but uh you never we know won't go there yeah we won't go there no um, we do know we do yeah. <laughs> doge but, and shiba you know it's funny it's like one of the you know especially when we we're building blockworks back in like 2018 2019 one of the things that always gave me a lot of faith was going to uh this is my first time at eat denver but going to conferences like this because you just plug like you know, you look at charts and it's like all down and it's all bearish in the media and stuff like that. But then you plug into this industry and just the amount of people building, doing interesting projects. Yes. Uh, the human capital yes. in this space has always been a relentless source of encouragement to me, I would say. Um, I so totally agree. Look, follow the talent. Uh, I tweet about this all the time. Follow the talent. This is the greatest talent migration in, you know, the last hundred years. Uh you know, there's probably bigger ones around building railroads and that kind of stuff, but but this is the biggest one. It's bigger than the internet, um, bigger than the mobile net, and and the quality and quantity of people migrating into the space is mind numbing, in a good way, in a really good Completely way. Completely agree. Um, so we've got a big show uh, for listeners today. Um, just as a caveat, we were actually going to do a special crossover uh, today with the the hosts of. Uh, but they uh, chickened out. <laughs> oh, I'm unavailable. You. Okay, Santiago, I'm throwing it down. Come on, get on the show. Now, Mark, Mark, come on, let's be fair. I would never accuse my co-founder, Jason, of being a huge chicken and chickening out. I would never call him I, I, Colonel I know Sanders would never say from being an enormous chicken. Were, I would never say that. that they were I would so chicken. I mean, you would never say that. And I, I actually probably wouldn't say that about Santiago either, but... but. <laughs> Your chicken's harsh. But yeah, it's all right. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll bring it next fits. week. I mean, well, <laughs> truth. Truth is an absolute defense. Truth is an absolute defense. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the Colonel uh, and Santiago coming on next week. It's going to be a ton of fun. Uh, in the meantime, today, the stories that we're going to be Colonel, going Colonel, is- I love it. I love it. Colonel Sanders, the chicken. The Colonel. Um, all right, so we're going to be going through what's going on in Canada uh, and some of the... Fr- uh, basically freezing accounts of going on over there. But I want to do a quick update before we get we get into that um, on just what's going on in the United States um, and some quick update on markets. So I'm going to... All right. So look, what we're looking at here is uh, basically inflation um, and what, what the... G, so the G20 summit is meeting this coming week. Um, and I think at the top of their mind is surging energy prices. So what you're looking at here is uh, G20 nations and you're looking at a, a gradient of green, which basically indicates how much energy costs are rising. Uh, you can see it's pretty much impacting everyone across the board. In South America, things are particularly bad. Um, but uh, in the U.S., it's pretty bad as well, right? We're hovering around that uh, 7.5% or so uh, inflation rate. So what are your thoughts just when you look at this and how much um, do you think energy is going to be playing into uh, this global meeting of leaders in the coming week? Look, energy is huge on, in, in every way because it, it's, it's geopolitical, uh, which that's that's part of this. Uh, it's financial markets. You know, the biggest part of this, particularly in the United States, is just the ridiculous 
leverage that was granted to horrible companies to mm-hmm. buy assets at, at just ridiculous prices, uh, acreage down in Texas and, and others. And finally, finally, with the COVID lockdowns, uh, which were a bad idea, which we'll talk about later, but mm-hmm. uh, they forced some of these companies into bankruptcy. And, and that took a bunch of supply offline. And, um, you know, we have a supply problem today in, in oil and gas. And there's not enough reinvestment of, of cash flow. It's getting better. Uh, these companies finally, finally, after a couple of decades, are generating some free cash. And that's, that's in the U.S. Then, then you go across the way and you got the, the nonsense uh, geopolitics of, of Russia and the rest of, of Europe. Uh, you know, I, I love the fact that, you know, it's you've seen the pictures of Turkey, right, with the, the snow and, and it, it's freezing. And like, well, what are you going to do now? You know, solar isn't going to work here. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, Russia has has all the cards there on, on their gas and all that that geopolitical stuff is all about pipelines that go through that that center corridor. And then the, the master stroke of by the, the 3D chess player himself you know, Putin is, is crushing people on the Nash, uh, the international front and signing the big deal with China is is a huge masterstroke. And you'll notice China's rate of inflation in energy is, is not that high. And that's because, mm-hmm. one, they build lots of nuclear because they don't fear nuclear, which you shouldn't fear nuclear. Now, you probably don't want to put the ski slope next to the nuclear plant like they did for the olympics i thought that was a little that much. Was such a botch but, uh, oh my god it was such a botch like, uh, but i think i think that? it was intentional i think it was intentional right they don't do anything unintentionally i think mm-hmm. that was absolutely intentional to say look it's totally safe to be you know near a nuclear plant and it is it actually mm-hmm. is let me let me ask you a question about that i hear that so often is china doesn't do anything unintentional how much of that is like, actually, I mean, you're, you're the expert here, so I'm genuinely asking you, like, how much of that is true? Are they just 10 steps ahead of the United States? It's, it, you know, I Absolutely. get the impression. Really? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, mm. they are, they're, they're just better. They're better leaders. They're better planners. They plan in 30-year increments. Mm. 30 years. So from 1990 to 2020 was the last 30-year plan. And in that period, they took 700 million people out of abject poverty and moved them into the middle class during what was called the harmonious rise, where they wanted to create a moderately prosperous socialism economy, right? Mm -hmm. Harmonious rise. Sounds so nice. Sounds so good. Non-threatening. Now, the 30-year plan from 2020 to 2050 is to become a dominant socialism economy. A global superpower. So they are, I, I talk about this all the time, right? We in the United States and Europe, we argue about how to set up the checkerboard to start the game. They're playing Go. They're playing a different game. And if you know anything about Go, Go is not about dominating just the center square like in chess, right? Or checkers. It's about regional advantage on the board, and surrounding your opponent to basically, you know, force submission. And that's what they do. And so they're, they're always 10, 20, whatever steps ahead. Uh, everything they do is um, thought out and planned. And, and part of it is, you know, they're managing. Think about managing an economy of 1.4, 1.5 billion people. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's a big job. And so anyway... Yeah. I'll say, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I mean, China is interesting to me. I feel like it's one of the three big areas of divergence where you've got super smart people stacked on either side. Um, and for me, the areas yep. that I always point out are crypto, Tesla, and China in general. And, you know, you've got some people saying that, yeah. um, you know, China is it's going to overtake the world stage. It's going to be the largest economy very soon. It's the largest uh, country by populace. Uh, they're very, very smart thinkers over there. And then you've got some people that say it's all a huge house of cards. Uh, the debt that they've racked up over there, their real estate sector, which is imploding uh, right now, by the way, there's certainly uh, quite a bit of trouble over there. Um, it, it's all it's all going to come crumbling down. It's just it's just interesting to me. And it's funny that you point out the story of Xi as a human. Um, just go read his Wikipedia page. I, I'm I'm attracted to human stories. I love just uh, reading about uh, these 
yeah. you know, people that have done absolutely wild things. And that guy has a crazy story. I, I don't, I'm speaking here not having really a personal opinion on the subject. I don't really know where I come yeah. down. But yeah, the, the personal story of that guy is, is pretty bonkers. Um, well, you know what's, what's amazing, mm. just, just real quickly, is you know, everybody's talking about how dominant you know, the U.S. is and how strong the dollar was last year. No, it wasn't. The mm. dollar fell 2% against the renminbi. It only went up against the yen and the euro. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. That's, that's nonsense. I mean, and you know, we label China a currency manipulator. Who's a worse currency manipulator than the Europeans, than the Germans? Mm. Right? They get all the, sh- the shitty countries, I guess I'm not supposed to say that, the bleep countries uh, into, into the euro to weaken the euro, not to strengthen the euro. They didn't add Greece to, weak, to strengthen the euro. They added Greece to weaken the euro because they are a mercantilist nation and they need a weak currency globally to sell machine tools and cars. So, you know, again, and China takes advantage of it. Go to China. Volkswagens everywhere, Mercedes everywhere, and they buy them cheaply because they let the Europeans devalue their currency, and you know they take advantage by having great automobiles all over their roads, which are amazing. The roads are truly amazing. You know, I don't know if you've seen the roads in the United States lately, but they pale in comparison. Yeah, it just seems like infrastructure is such an unbelievable win. And I know we've got that big bill that's uh, investing in it. So I, I haven't looked into it um, super deeply. So I don't really know where a lot of those funds are going. But none so of it's going to go into infrastructure. It's all going to go to pork. Because look, Mayor Pete, right? My, my guy, my fave, has, mm. says it best, right? There's no left or right Republican or Democrat way to fill a pothole. You fill the pothole. Mm-hmm. And that's the problem. Yeah. Everything in politics in the United States is far left or far right. There is no, let's just fill the pothole. It's mm-hmm. how can I get money for this drug company that paid me half a million dollars into my campaign so I make them the COVID czar and magically the FDA approves an untested, untried uh, novel therapeutic and calls it a vaccine. I mean, that is nonsense. Mm -hmm. But that's the way it works. Well, you know, it's funny. I mean, there's no left or right way to fill a pothole. I I generally think, um, so one thing, I don't know if you follow Peter Zihan. uh, He's a great geopolitical strategist Mm -hmm. in general. And he's made the observation, and it's true, that political parties um, fracture and reform uh, every hundred or so years uh, in the United States. The modern day Democratic and Republican parties are about 100 years old. Uh, and that's yeah. about the shelf life of political parties. Typically, yeah. if you go back and it's look called at the Democratic Republicans, I mean, right. at the beginning. Well, I, I think it actually was against the, the Federalists, Federalists, and the Republicans. And the Republicans would map to the modern. But they were day called Democrats. Democratic Republicans. That's mm. the crazy thing. It was yeah. one big term, and and the Federalists were the other side. Yeah. So, my little observation here uh, before we move on to this next chart is that I actually think left and right no longer do a great job of describing. Um, how people are aligned in this country. Uh, Like, I'll just say, as as someone who doesn't feel particularly well represented by either political party at the current time, it seems like what's happening right now is that you have two groups of people that are either have this idea that, hey, there's a lot of uh, folks out there in the world who have interests that are contrary to the United States, and everything that we should do, do should be in service of unifying and granting more powers to the government. And then there's a group of people that say, Actually, the problem really is the centralization of power in governments. And what we should be doing right now is limiting power to governments. Mm -hmm. And that loosely falls right along the ideologies of the modern day Democrats and Republicans, which is why I think you see more Democrats being honestly anti-crypto, which is seeming like, unfortunately, that's starting to happen. And uh, it seems like more Republicans are kind of because they've got that libertarian small government kind of bent or aligning with crypto. But ultimately... I, I don't think either party is going to last. I, I, I don't think that the young generation feels particularly well represented yeah. by either party. I, I don't want to speak for totally agree. No, look, I, 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 I've people. been saying for a long time there there are no there are no parties anymore. There's no left. There's no right. There's no Democrat. There's no Republican. There's in and out. Mm-hmm. You're either in or you're out. And when you're in, you do or say whatever it takes to stay in. Mm-hmm. Right. Think about the greatest budget deficit in the history of the Republic came under a Republican administration. 
Yeah. It's not possible, right? It's mm-hmm. not possible. But it doesn't matter because it's not about left and right. It's about in. I'm in. I will do or say whatever it takes to stand. And if I'm out, I will do or say whatever it takes to get in. Mm-hmm. Joe Biden. I hate big oil. I'm going after big oil. Gets elected. Oil? You pay me money? I love you. Oil prices take off. Mm -hmm. This chart, right? Why are oil prices taking off? Because they lie. Mm. And they don't do any of the things that they say they're going to do. And so, anyway, it's... I totally agree. Uh, Although, I I agree with with you for a different reason, right? To Mm. me, it's all just about power. You describe it much better, as always, about how the ideology has fractured. And I think that's an important point. Yeah. Um, I want to move on here to talk about markets a little bit. So this is a survey, the American Association of Individual Investors. They run this survey. They've been doing it for a long time. What you're basically looking at here um, is uh, the S&P, right? And you're looking at the percentage of investors that are uh, bullish or bearish. Um, There are less than 30% of investors uh, who are bullish um, in response to this survey. Uh, That's only happened like uh, I think 31 weeks uh, since they've been running the survey, uh, 29 out of those 31 weeks have been followed by uh, a positive return in the stock market in general. Uh, so that's slightly leading um, take, yeah. uh, I guess. Um, what do you think about when you look at this chart? As, as, as you're putting it up, I, I thought about two things. I mm. thought about um, one, you know, the chart crime of a long-term chart that's not log scale. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, I knew you were going to say that. So, <laughs> no, no, no. But, 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 but that's, that's not you. You didn't make the chart. Yeah. Um, and, and so that always makes me crazy, right? When, when people show these, these hockey stick charts, they're not, they're not relevant. Um, the second thing it made me think about is, uh, well, actually two related things. One uh, has the, the demographic of the survey changed? And I don't know the answer to that, right? I don't, I don't know mm. if they're still surveying boomers or if now they're surveying millennials. Um, so there's, there's some information content that, that, that I think uh, would be important there. And then, and then the third was, has technology made this survey um, different? in the sense that either higher participation, right? You think about mail surveys or telephone surveys, you probably didn't get a very good representation, right? The people that answered the phone because they want to talk to the survey, right? That's a certain type of person. The person was like, ooh, I'm not, I'm not participating. And so I just don't know if any of that has changed. Uh, if we assume that it's all the same, then clearly this is a... Uh, a, a very good contrarian indicator of of what's likely to happen. I think the challenge for me is all of the period up to the last five, six, seven years, I think is really accurate because it mm-hmm. had to do with cycles and emotional flow. Things mm-hmm. didn't happen as quickly. You didn't have social media fracturing and putting people on sides polarizing and you didn't have the fed doing what they've never done before right which is basically flooding the world with money and and just putting a a, for the first time ever right the the fed put actually looks like it's working right you go back to alan greenspan right everybody said oh you got the greenspan put the market can't go down and then it went down 65 percent and then they said you had the Bernanke put and the market went down during the global financial crisis. But after the global financial crisis, there really has been a put. And any time you get even a 5% drop, these guys, oh, more money, more money, more money. And, you know, we've talked about this before. Like I, I am convinced there will be nowhere close to seven interest rate hikes, not not even close. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll take the way under. I don't even think, I, I, I don't, I really, if you ask me, I really don't even think they're going to raise in March. But I think they have to do something. But yeah. I think they know they can't. I mean, GDP growth collapsing towards zero, you know, people out of work. I mean, stresses on the economy, lockdown measures still impacting supply chain. 
there's no way you would hike into the numbers. But they've not hiked for so long that they're stuck. And so that's a long-winded way of saying, Michael, that uh, I do think there's a little bit of hopium from the bulls that see nobody's bullish except us. So, it, you know, it has to go up. And I, I do think it's possible if the Powell pivot happens. And, and okay. I do think it's happening. I do think it's happening. All right. So, <laughs> Mark, you and I are synced up, man. All right. So remember- Of course we, we are. Of course. <laughs> we, I mean, well, I, I, I said this, I said this last, I've talked to somebody and uh, this, this great CIO at, at uh, University of Miami. And I said, you know, we're, we're brothers from other mothers, well, mm. except that I could be your father. So we are brothers, except I, I technically could, could be your father. But We've got a little um, bit of age in between. But look at this. I mean, this is a part. So we, remember we covered ah, this chart. There we go. Yeah, look, yeah we covered this chart. so good. Wait, we covered this chart like three weeks ago. I got to give uh, the, the the credit here to Mr. Blonde Macro, who has just continued to update this chart. So what we're looking at here is the six-month trading pattern around that time period that you were just referencing, uh, April of 2018 to January of 2019, which is famously known as the Powell Pivot. So we're looking here at the S&P, and we're looking at uh, the high-yield uh, spreads uh, index. So basically, you know, this is an update uh, since the last time that we showed this three weeks later, and the pattern is still holding now. You should always be careful when people overlay one chart on top of another. Uh, correlation does not equal causation. And in general, you can, it looks very convincing, but you know, we're just kind of trying to pattern match here. That being said- When you have to rebase, you have to, again, you have chart crime, you have to rebase the indices because mm -hmm. you know, 400 to 500 is different than you know, 1,000 to 900. But, mm -hmm. but, but generally speaking, uh, I think it's 100% it's accurate. Mm-hmm. Maybe not uh, in terms of, of magnitude, but directionally, I think it's absolutely accurate. accurate. So, you know, when you talk about things like the PAL, the PAL put, um, and I want to return to that idea of it being different pre-Great Financial Crisis and post-Great Financial Crisis. So don't let me, don't let me forget about that. But part of, um, mm -hmm. you know, part of what factors into things is the rate of change or acceleration in general. So if you mm -hmm. look at the box mm -hmm. that we've got highlighted here, the growth scare, you know, that was a really precipitous fall, right, in terms of the S&P. And you also, at the same time, saw credit spreads blowing out, right? So yep. I think what happens is we're all just uh, monkeys at the end of the day, right? So when we see charts and things move really fast, our brains just extrapolate it out. And you say, what if it kept moving this fast, you know, for another month or another two months? And then it becomes too much. Um, and, and then you kind of cave and make changes. So I think the thing to watch or the thing that I would be watching is just rate of change, uh, either in the S&P and the NASDAQ or looking at mm -hmm. credit markets, spreads to blow out too quickly. I think that's what would make the Fed potentially pause. Uh, but right now they're dealing with something pretty political, right? Like they've got, you know, inflation has become uh, a household, you know, no one in, yes. in, in, no one yes. in residential homes across America was saying inflation two years ago and now they are. And surprise, surprise, the politicians yeah. at the Fed have sat up and take, and they're taking notice, right? And they have to be seen as doing something. So I think there's yeah, but here's the funny thing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's literally, literally, like uh, I'm gonna use a bad analogy, but okay. So so it's winter time, and you got a big mm -hmm. old icicle on, on your house, mm -hmm. and so and then you you notice a couple of loose nails. You're like, ah, I don't want to go inside and get the hammer. I'm just gonna grab that icicle, and you, you try to hit the the nail with the icicle. And what happens? The icicle shatters mm. because it ain't a hammer. And so this idea that, that the Fed can solve the problem that they created, right? We, we don't have inflation, right? I'm, I'm pausing for a drama here. We don't have inflation. <laughs> we have currency devaluation. Mm. It is not inflation. Inflation is caused by an imbalance of goods and services. This is not that. This is currency devaluation. And it was explicit and intended. And, you know, there was just this new article celebrating Stephanie Kelton. Mm. She's Elizabeth Holmes fraudulent. I mean, mm. and, and I, I shouldn't say that. I probably shouldn't name names. But, but she is. It, it's, it's fraud. This idea of modern monetary theory is witchcraft. It's, it's like voodoo economics. It does. It trickle down economics. All mm. of it is bullshit. I mean, total bullshit. And the idea that the Fed can somehow now 
drain liquidity from the system and control the fact that they devalued the currency by 40% over 18 months is nonsense. It's like hitting a nail with an icicle. It's going to shatter and it's going to be worse than... Uh, I just I get really angry well, about this. I, I would draw... I would The way that I think about inflation kind of is that you've got two different types of inflation. You've got financial asset inflation, then you've got real economy inflation in general. And my... Uh, you know, kind of uh, in the middle of the bell curve type type thought here is that in general, what we're actually seeing in terms of CPI and goods, I, I think that is probably maybe more traditional inflation in the uh, in the sense that supply chain uh, problems are causing a lot of this, right? Like you look at used cars and the effect that that's had on CPI overall, and mm-hmm. you know that that's not a permanent thing. But you know, we're going to talk nope. about housing, and that to me is actually. That that's real inflation, and I know, and, and I know that gets translated into CPI via owner's equivalent rent and stuff like that. But um, you know, I, I think the the amount of money that's been printed is really translated more to financial assets, and that that you know, there's this idea that that's separate f- from the real economy. It, but it it's is not. a real asset, right? It, it's a physical, tangible asset. But we, again, mm-hmm. we've talked about this. Houses don't appreciate. Mm-hmm. They don't, right? They actually wear out. Right? A house does not grow. Right? You don't get new bedrooms by watering the yard. Right? The house actually starts to fall down. Mm-hmm. And so you actually have to put money into the house to continue to make it better. You gotta paint, you gotta you gotta, you know, pound in the, the errant nails. What what grows in value is the land. Mm. Well, the land doesn't grow either, right? My lot did not get bigger. I'm sitting here in my library, my lot does not get bigger. Stays the same. What happens? The currency in which I value it is going down and going down a lot. And mm. now you can say, well, but but the land is scarce and there's more people coming. Yeah, there are more the people. I was going to say you, you can okay. say there are more people. True, true, true. But we have plenty of land, plenty of land, <laughs> plenty, like tons yeah. of land, and. Yeah. People, oh, but it's not, it's not right there. It's not three miles from campus where I want to, oh, sorry, you have to live four miles from campus or five miles from campus. Deal with it. Uh, no, we have plenty of land. And it's, what we have, the problem is government, back to government. We have the People's Republic of Chapel Hill that will not approve permits fast enough and they will not approve. I mean, there's this 800 acre development, right? Right where my office is. It took 10 years, Michael, 10 years to get mm-hmm. the permits. 10 years. No, I get I mean, that. that's a lunatic. Come a on. <laughs> it's it's insane. And yeah. so it, it anyway. Go so for it. here's here's why we talk about housing a lot, right? Just uh, we haven't talked about housing in a little bit, so I want to just refresh for the viewers um, or the listeners why we talk about this so much. Housing is really important because that's baked into the American social contract in general, right? Housing, it's, it's kind of baked right in there into, uh, you know, I mean, if you think about the reason why people came to America in the first place, it was because people wanted to own their own land and to set their own mm-hmm. religious laws, but let's just focus on the land part of things. Um, we, as, as a people, as a society, have basically decided it is a good and virtuous thing for people to own land. That's why we allow people to essentially lever themselves to the hilt, right, to take out mortgages so that they can own their home. And what that does is that provides gigantic financial unlock for people, right? Because your home, to your point, right, whether legitimately or illegitimately due to currency manipulation, the, the value of that home tends to appreciate, right? So there's a, there's a statistic, it's like 80% of people's, I want to be careful, I'm not sure about this, but it's, it's, a, it's a large number of people's personal net worth is, is due to their home. Um, and it also is a financial unlock because if you want to take a risk and start a business, you can use it as collateral. So the reason that you and I often mm-hmm. highlight the rising price of homes in the United States uh, is because it makes it that much harder. Uh, it makes it that much harder for young people to essentially see the path right to financial freedom. This was supposed to be the first stepping stone, and you can see the age of people, as the average age of the home buyer in the United States, it's getting older and older and older. Now, that's not as bad as it is in other uh, developing nations. If you actually look at median income to home price in something like Shanghai, it's like off the charts. It's absolutely ridiculous. I think it's like five times more expensive than even New mm-hmm. York or Seattle. Mm-hmm. But still, it's getting worse, and that's why it's problematic. Um, you know, I was thinking about this as you were talking about oil, right, uh, and commodities. And there's a funny relationship where it's like the the, the price, the, the cure for high prices in commodities is high prices, right? Because generally yes. people use Always. commodities. So kind of if you're not a speculator, uh, you know, try, 
everyone kind of wants low commodity prices in general. Homes are really interesting. And I think the U.S. has put itself in a little bit of a pickle when it comes to housing because you want high home prices, kind of, because a lot of people's net worth is tied up in those homes. So you don't want it crashing down. But at the same time, you don't want it so high that the next generation can't afford to purchase homes. Oh, see, Michael, you're, you're trying to be logical. Right, <laughs> right, but it's so not. You try to be logical, would, and 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 your logic out. is impeccable. Your logic is impeccable. Again, as as always, but but it's not. It's not about logic. This is about control and power, and and this again. This is part of the plan. And if if people don't see it, they're fooling themselves. Right. This is who is in control around the world. Octogenarians, right. I, Boomers. I was going to draw it. Yeah. I, I yeah. mean, this is this. Look, this is a sinister, right? Sinister Saturday, right? This is all sinister. This is not this is not accidental. This is intentional. Look, entitlements are the problem. Hmm. What is an entitlement? An entitlement is a promise you make to yourself that you don't fund and you ask your kids to pay for. So you said you 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 shouldn't you should think about the next generation. They don't give a shit about the next generation. They want the next generation to pay for their stuff. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, right? Free. Free. My dad has had, you know, touch with multiple heart surgeries. He's doing great. All of it for free. <laughs> for free. Mm -hmm. And it it it's crazy. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and it's those people at the top of this hierarchy have perpetuated this thing. To, exactly as you said, when I was growing up, my parents could write off everything. They could write off mortgage interest, credit card interest. There were no student loans back then because uh, it was just a substitute for other mortgage, or mortgage debt. But they, they, they could write off everything. Now, what can you write off? Mortgage mm -hmm. interest. Why? Because the housing industry paid them a lot of money to keep that going. And to your point, housing, land, housing, if it's in the hands of the, your cronies, and it's not as bad here as it is in China, right? The reason China's prices have gone up is because they limited who could own the land. So they gave the land to all their cronies, and then they pumped up the price. And if you look around all the dictatorships around the world, that's how it works. You know, the smaller the crony group like Venezuela, the worse it is for the population. So the rich get super rich and the bottom get trounced. But in the United States, it was like, hey, as long as our asset that we need for retirement goes up, then we're all good. And so at all cost, they're going to devalue the currency, which is which the, the asset is priced in. So even though it's a real physical asset that I'm sitting in a house, it really is a financial asset because no one actually owns it. Right? Mm -hmm. They mortgage it, they lever it, and that's good for the banks. And it's good. So it's it's a very complex uh, network effect. Because the other point you make, which is really important, most employment gains come from small business. Most small businesses are financed by uh, home equity, uh, mm -hmm. not by bank loans, although bank loans are certainly a part of it. But but home equity has historically been how the entrepreneur says, hey, I'm going to go start a business, take a home equity line and go do it. This episode is brought to you by Fireblocks. I talk to a lot of fast growing crypto native funds, crypto banks, exchanges and the like, and they all tell me they have the same two problems. One, their treasury management setup sucks. They've got analysts wasting time and money on manual transactions. Two, they are not happy with their current security setup. They're sharing passwords, they're sending test transactions, and they're worried that their funds might be at risk. Fireblocks is a platform that solves all of that for you. They're a one-stop shop portal, which automatically plugs into exchanges, trading venues, etc. They source deep liquidity and solve everything from day-to-day -day crypto transactions all the way down to complex DeFi strategy. And the best thing about Fireblocks is that they offer scalable solutions with industry-leading technology. Doesn't matter if you're a two-person crypto fund or a 2,000-person crypto exchange, these guys have you covered. And the last thing that I'll say about this company is that I have known them for years. They are a high-integrity team. They ship product like no other. I would trust them with my own funds. So 
click the link at the bottom of this page and tell them that I sent you. Very, very important that you click the link at the bottom here. Otherwise, they're not going to know that I sent you. And then how am I going to get credit? So help a brother out. Click the link at the bottom of this episode. Tell them I sent you. Right. Um, so I would agree with you with a slight slight twist, um, which is that I think you've actually put your... It's funny. I was talking to my friends about this uh, the other night. Um, I, I do think it is funny that we have... You know, the people that are representing us in politics now, we're like deciding between 80 year olds. And look, I'm, I'm not trying to be ageist here, but like at a certain point, right, you know, the world that you know from your, your prior experience has changed pretty significantly. And I, I'm a believer that people just respond to incentives in general, right? Like, of course, so if you, of right? course. I don't think anyone's evil. I don't think anyone's like trying to put one over on anyone else, but I think you have here. There are a few a evil of, people. Yeah. Maybe. But, but there are all, all the time, right? But I think what you have here yeah. is a group of people that have a disproportionate amount of the wealth, and therefore they make decisions that are in their best interests, right? And I think if you looked at the world through that lens, a lot of stuff would start making more sense to you, right? So, like, mm -hmm. think about you know big decisions being made in the United States specifically, and start thinking of yourself as like, okay, I'm not however old I am, right? Uh, in my twenties, I'm actually eighty. And how would I think about approaching this problem? And suddenly a lot of stuff would start making sense to you. Oh, um, come on. Donald Trump, right? Lobbying and getting past the change in the inheritance tax. So his family would benefit, right? And his other, you know, octogenarian friends would benefit. So it, it's all about incentives. And, and when the person at the top is acting in their own best interest. Mm. And it's and it's not just one person, right? Because you got to get the other 500, what is it, 538, 538 people to, to go along. But most of them, most, not all. And that, that that is the one good thing, is there are more young people in politics now. Uh, they are making their voice heard. And, I, you know, I always love the, the, the picture of 35-year-old Joe Biden you know, yelling, pass the torch, pass the torch. Like, dude, hand the torch off, right? This is a relay, right? Yeah. Pass the torch. It's time to pass the torch. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd feel much better, as I said, if, if you know, my, my uh, you know, late 30s Mayor Pete was president instead of the, the late 70s or early 80s dude mm -hmm. we got now. Right. Well, yeah, so I, I just, that's my... My kind of view. I want to. I want to actually get your opinion on something uh, before we move into our last story here, which is uh, the Freedom Convoy and, and everything that's going on in Canada right now. Oh, but I can't wait. I know. So, okay, man. I read this take, and um, this is the reason I'm reading this is not to uh, poo poo anyone's opinion or anything like that. But here, here's why. Here's why I want to read this take out. I have been kind of consistently surprised about some of the pushback that crypto gets. In general. And I think mm -hmm. uh, being introspective, it's like, you know, I've been in this industry for four years. I've really uh, committed to it. I see a lot of the value. And I think being so in it myself, sometimes it's hard. It's harder for me than it used to be to like take my sh myself out of my own shoes, take a look at this industry and what some of people's objections yep. might be. So let me, yep. let me, let me read you this take, um, which comes from from Bloomberg. And again, I'm reading this not to poo poo anyone's opinion, but yep. it's really instructive for me to actually look at so I just want to put myself in other people's shoes. Fans of Larry David and LeBron James were grossed out by their appearances in Super Bowl ads touting crypto, crossed out gambling, trading platforms. Both men have built reputations as siding with underdogs, but they risked them for a big payday, all in crypto, presumably, from an industry building a reputation for taking underdogs to the kill shelter. That This was really interesting for me to read because... Um, a, I thought the Larry David commercial was hysterical, um, yep. and I thought Coinbase yep. was really cool too. Uh, but very good. You know, this I, this is the first time I've ever heard because I have been under the assumption operating in crypto this whole time that we're the underdogs, right? Like I that I I never even questioned that fundamental assumption that like yeah we're kind of up against it, right? It's been constant speculation for the last twelve years, disparagement in mainstream media. Uh, it still feels like the decks are stacked against us, and mm -hmm. to hear. An outsider's perspective say this actually, I think there's a growing perception that people actually have made a lot of money in crypto and like, hey, if you can't get in here and take risks, then you don't deserve financial freedom. And I just think that that's something that this was a surprising take to me when I let my emotional guard down and like let myself listen to the pushback. It actually made a yep. lot of sense to me. And I think that's this is a wake up call for our industry to 
grow up um, and stop saying things like have fun staying poor. That's not going to be yes. helpful um, to people. Like we need – so anyway, I just thought oh, it was that, an that interesting has, take that, on that has never – yeah, I, I, again, couldn't agree more. And uh, I, I – one of the things I love most about the last – kind of eight year journey and, and really it's it's more the last five but what I love about this journey is hanging out with people like you right young smart hungry uh, people with with vision and and I love that part but man there's so many so many of them that slip into this you know never gonna make it have fun staying poor it's dumb it, it's it's always been dumb Mm-hmm. And this this idea that that you should I don't know flaunt superiority or or flash your your Lambo you know it but it's not different than you know <laughs> Mr T right dating myself with his gold chains around his neck and you know his big mansion in Lake Forest people are always gonna are always gonna flaunt their wealth but if you if you want to be taken seriously to your point grow up Mm -hmm. and i think there are a lot of mature really thoughtful really great spokespeople and innovators in the space doing amazing things i don't i don't want to paint a broad brush but unfortunately it's it's always the vocal minority that gets the attention and to your point if if that creates a uh rift between the people who have the power and we're seeing this right now Right? Look at the big fine by the SEC uh, for BlockFi or, you know, who are they going to go after next? Why did they do that? Well, there was some antagonism. And Gensler wants to show everyone who's boss. He even said it. I mean, and then Hester, I, I, I love the fact. This is amazing. I love the fact that you can go out publicly and post pretty serious criticism of your boss. I mean, they're technically equal commissioners, I guess. One is more equal than the others. But I actually didn't know this, that they're like the Supreme Court. They're lifetime appointments. Mm. So Really? Um, I didn't know that either. And maybe they're not lifetime, Maybe, but you can't be removed. You can't actually be removed. Mm. Um, so maybe they do have a, a period of time, but I, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. I, I just think, it, look, it, it's, it always is helpful to try to take other people's perspective when people are pushing back. Look, and look, sometimes not everyone's going to agree with you all the time. And sometimes you do just need to say, okay, I know I'm not going to please everyone here, but I'm still going to do what I think the right thing is. But I think it is worth, um, you know, it's always worth trying to put yourself in someone else's shoes to see where they're coming from. That's well, never but, but Michael, look, think about this, right? If, if what we're working for is the rails of the new financial system, mm-hmm money over internet protocol, value over internet protocol. If, if that's what we're working towards, right? That is, that is infrastructure. That is, that is the meat and, and potatoes of, of the future. That is not a speculative, hey, let's, let's buy Dogecoin, right? Those are two antithetical things. That's a really good point. Um, and I want to, I know we're running low on time here, so I want to transition into our oh, no, last we, story. We can go over which is, which is everything that's going on in Canada. with So everything got kicked off with kind of the Freedom Convoy protests. And that was actually uh, earlier this week we aired an episode with uh, Alex Gladstein, uh, Jeff Booth, and Greg Foss, basically detailing exactly what's going on kind of on the ground in Canada. Awesome. Um, and, you know, at the time we recorded this, uh, the GoFundMe uh, campaign had basically just been, it was like 9 or $10 million that got shut down through the campaign. Initially, they were going to donate those funds to charity, which is nuts. <laughs> Uh, and then they said, actually, you can apply for a refund. Actually, we'll just return it to you. Pretty bonkers. But again, having sympathy, my suspicion at the time, which I think has been proven pretty right, is that someone in Canada said, hey, tap, tap, um, we don't like you doing this, so we're going to haul you up in front of uh, Parliament, and you're going to have to testify why you're funding. They would call it domestic terrorism, but it, I don't know if they would call it that. That's pretty extreme. But no, they do. Those they, enemies, they definitely call right? sedition. Sedition, I know, has been used. Yeah. So let me give you. Uh, so let me give you the update on what's happened since then. So since then, uh, Justin Trudeau has invoked the Emergencies Act, right? And that's that's pretty extreme, pretty extreme thing to do. It it limits for for a temporary period of time um, the ability for people to gather uh, in public squares and and things like that. The interesting thing, at least for 
uh, for the purposes of our discussion here is the attempt to kind of weaponize the financial system. So I'm reading here from an article in Fortune. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's emergency orders aimed at cutting off funds to protesters have cast a wide net across the Canadian financial industry, forcing portfolio managers and securities firms to take a harder look at who they're doing business with. The new rules make demands of a broad list of entities, including banks, investment firms, credit unions, loan companies, security dealers, fundraising platforms, this is me including this, including cryptocurrency uh, related fundraising platforms, now back to fortune, insurance companies, and fraternal benefit societies. They must determine whether they're in possession or control of property of a person who's attending an illegal protest or providing supplies to demonstrators, according to orders published by the government late on Tuesday night. That, okay. So basically, if you have donated funds to support the Canadian truckers uh, through a fundraising platform or, or basically any other way, what the government is saying now is we are going to personally name individuals uh, or banks or all of these different financial intermediaries are required to name individuals and submit it to the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And they have mm -hmm. been. Um, what, what, I, have, I have a lot of thoughts here. Um, what's your take on this? Gosh, so many, right? I mean, totalitarianism and authoritarianism run rampant. It's pretty scary stuff. And you, you, you look at what the woman in New Zealand or the guy in Canada or now Trudeau, and it's interesting that those three countries are roughly the same size, right? Around mm -hmm. that 20, I mean, New Zealand's a little smaller, but the other two are roughly the same size, 25 million people. And it's kind of like, well, let's, let's see how far we can push. Let's, let's basically invoke martial law and let's take away people's rights. And, and look, I, I've talked about this forever. If, if you believe anyone listening, anyone watching, any, anyone follows us on Twitter, if you believe that your money that you put in a bank is still your money, you're sadly mistaken. Right. And this is a really big problem. And that trust that we all have with that in, those institutions has now been shattered. And it's been shattered before. It was shattered in Cyprus and then people forgot. And um, it ain't your money. And imagine going to the ATM, punching in your code, and it says zero. Totally legal. They've taken your money for no reason, no warrant, no, you know, you're innocent until proven guilty. You are guilty because I, the government, say you're guilty. That is one of the most frightening things that I can imagine, right? And it's why everyone has to have some portion, you know, enough running money outside that system. And I'm saying we should just do a good do a big run on the bank because I do think fractional reserve banking is is a good thing generally speaking, mm -hmm. but I but I like it better in in a, in a non seizable asset. Uh, but I uh, I I think there's a reason that uh, sons of former presidents become presidents. Yeah, you know, my favorite quote about and look I I like W now. Um, wasn't a real big fan when he was president because then I realized that he never was president. He was proximate to the Cheney presidency. And I think that's what's going on here. Trudeau is not the prime minister. He never has been. Hmm. He is a vassal. He is a tool of this larger, broader group. And they have decided that now is the time to test how far they can push this new world order. And anyone who thinks it can't happen here, you're fooling yourself. You're absolutely fooling yourself. Here's the way that I frame these things. Take yourself out of, and this is the disclaimer that I provided for this episode as well. Take yourself out of the politics of this particular situation, right? Forget Trudeau, forget the, whether or not you agree with the truckers. And when the, the, I will die on this hill. The correct way to interpret government action is through precedent, i.e. they're doing this thing one time. Would you like it? if they were able to do this indefinitely into the future. And that's where I feel really confident in saying that there's a long history of governments taking emergency powers and never fully relinquishing them. 
you know, you know, after <laughs> after September 11, right? I mean, it's the, it's the Patriot Act, right? And that was supposed to be like super, super temporary. And now it's just, I mean, it's just baked right in there, right? So I think the right way to look at these things are- Income taxes were supposed to be temporary after the Spanish-American War. <laughs> Income taxes were supposed to be temporary yeah. after the Spanish-American War. You know, in uh, Rome too, they didn't have income tax for a long time and then it was supposed to be temporary. It was pretty wild. Uh, course, I didn't make that connection. Because uh, once a government takes power, it will never relinquish. Right. So and I think this th- is a, a hill to die on. This is important. So I think, the, so if you're listening to this podcast and you're thinking, but these truckers are, are blocking uh, vital ways, whatever. Here's just, just a reminder on why public assembly is important. Right. So here's what you're not allowed to do as a pro, in, a, in a protesting form. You're not allowed to block access to critical food passageways. You're not allowed to block passages to hospitals because at the end of the day, society still has to run and function. But the, you know, the reason why we have freedom to public, public assembly in America right, is because we thought civil disobedience is part of civil society. Right? We actually bake that right into the Constitution. We, we want people to be able to protest the government because pro- what protesting says is, hey, we're going to clang around and make noise and we're going to let you know how unhappy we are and, and distinctly why we're unhappy so that we can affect change. And the fact that you have a government that is essentially saying that's unlawful is it's a pretty worrisome precedent to set. And so the reason that I say this for folks, you know, I want to remove the politics from this and just say, imagine if something happened in the country that you vehemently disagreed with, right? Whatever it is, uh, something happening with the education system and your kids, uh, maybe it's something related to health care that becomes unaffordable, whatever mm-hmm. it is, something that's critical to something that you feel really strongly about. And you go and you try to protest it, and then essentially all of the wealth that you think you have in your bank account gets frozen. I mean, just just I, what I would leave people with is like I would I would think about that. That's a it's a very slippery road to to go down. Um, and look, I, I, and, and we have so many examples. In fact, Trudeau right tweeting out the quote from a couple hundred years ago when you know when the when the government uh, fails to allow dissent it slips into its worst form of tyranny, right? He mm-hmm. sent out the tweet of the quote, <laughs> and here he is not allowing dissent, and he has become the worst form of tyranny. And, but said, I, I don't think this is accidental. And my, my big thing on the, on the protest, right? Okay, so they blocked the bridge. You're telling me that a government, which actually has unlimited resources, can't, line up a bunch of planes and fly over the bridge and get all the stuff? Really? Can't do that? Is that stupid? Right? It's, it's just, it's, it's illogical. What you'd rather do is use the protest, like, you know, the Tiananmen Square thing. You use it, right? Never let a good crisis go to waste. That's, that's, I think that's what's going on, right? You could solve the problem. You could go around the blockade. You could, I mean, let them have their party. Let them have their Woodstock. Yeah, actually, pipe in music. You know, send them some sandwiches. But that's, that doesn't get you what you want if what you want is weaponizing the financial system. And that is a absolutely terrifying thought. Yeah. The weaponization terrifying. of the financial system is, is really worrisome to me. And I think this should be a call for governments in general to wake up and listen to their, to their people. Right? I mean, the other thing that I would just – I want to continue to highlight – because it's such a departure from uh, how these things have been treated historically was, you know, Trudeau kind of coming out and saying, this is a, a fringe view. This is a minority view that does not represent the majority of Canadians. And look, guys, I don't know how many times we have to repeat the same mistakes here. The same exact thing was said about Donald Trump. This is a fringe minority view. This is a loud minority. This does not represent the view of Americans. Then, then the guy got elected. And like, look, I, I just think, you know, it, p- picture yourself as a leader of a company or your family. When people complain to you, the correct thing to do is to take them seriously. That's all I'm going to say. So like mm-hmm. this, this idea that we're just going to shut people down by saying this fringe, this doesn't represent the majority. Guys, there's clearly something going on. We, we need to open our minds and wake up to the fact that people might have legitimate grievances here. And we need, we need to listen to them and try to do better because we're not headed in a super great direction right now. It seems like things are moving further apart and the other hill I'll die on is the hill of optimism. I believe we have so much more in common than we do uh, in, in, in difference. Yeah. We're all freaking yeah. monkeys, man. I, so, like, I, I just think, please, uh, if you're listening to the show, A, 
I, I view things in, in terms of governments. I, you got to view it in terms of precedent, and, and I would always try to see things from the other side. Um, I don't know. I have opinions, but I Amen. can always see both sides of the issue. Um, all right. Amen. So with, with that, um, we got to conclude here. Uh, Mark, this has been a ton of fun, uh, as always. always. Um, best, best hour, hour of my week. Weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry I missed you. you last week, but uh, it, uh, we just couldn't make it work with Travis. Oh, I did the thing I said I wasn't going to do. I want to ask you about the great financial. We'll ask, well, next week, we'll, we'll kick off with that. Um, but all right. Uh, this has been a ton of fun, my friend. Um, I will see you same time next week. Cheers. All right. Have a good Bye. one.